again, may I say it's a great joy to be here and to have fellowship again with you. And uh, I have to can say truly, it's been a joy in anticipating coming. And uh, it's been a blessed uh, day of fellowship for me too. This evening, <clears throat> I'd like us to consider part of chapter 6, where it's a very well-known portion of the Word of God, and I'm sure when I read that, the Lord's Prayer, you thought, is this another sermon on prayer? Well, it's not. I sometimes think we Christians are so defective in prayer that when we hear a sermon on prayer, we almost automatically cringe because we know we're going to be made to feel guilty. Again, if I might quote that dear man, Dr. Lloyd Jones, he said this. He said, it is proof positive that you've never prayed if you've never felt it hard to pray. Proof positive that you have never prayed if you've never found it hard to pray. True, isn't it? Prayer is one of the hardest things we find, isn't it, brethren? We want to pray. We know we should pray. We desire to pray. But alas, how we fail. So it's not another sermon on prayer this evening, so be, be relaxed. Nonetheless, I'd like to bring in a, a gospel context to this. Look at the Lord's Prayer. It's various aspects. It's a pattern of prayer, of course. From a very early age, we were taught, to, some of us at school, the Lord's Prayer. We, we quoted it parrot fashion, uh, and we missed out so much. But it is a, a general pattern that the Lord uh, would give us to employ. Of course, again, by way of general consideration, it's taken for granted that Christians pray. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer is the Christian's native air. I wonder how many of us can say that, <clears throat> as with Luther, Martin Luther could say this, I cannot get through a day without three hours of prayer. Very, very sobering, isn't it? We're going to consider these three words. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Whose kingdom does this refer to? Who reigns in this kingdom? What type of kingdom is it? Who will be allowed to enter into this kingdom? Sadly, who will be excluded from this kingdom? Firstly, by, by way of just consideration, who reigns in this kingdom? It is a kingdom. A king reigns supreme there. King of kings, Lord of lords, reigns with unparalleled glory and honour. God is the king of all the earth. He sits upon the throne of his holiness. Heaven is a place of unparalleled holiness. This is the reason, brethren, why the ungodly would, would be most ill at ease in heaven. People say, I'd like to go to heaven. And here's the reality. The unregenerate, the unforgiven, would hate being in heaven. Imagine those who love sin being with those who are made holy. Those whose lives have been spent in the pursuit of sin and corruption and lust being in the presence of holiness itself. No wonder the ungodly cry on that day, Lord, hide us from thy, thy gaze. May the ground swallow us up. May the earth swallow us up from thy presence. And this is the reality. The natural man, if I understand the doctrine of the natural man, he has no heart for heaven. He may have a head for heaven, but no heart for heaven. He would, of all people, be the most unhappy to be in the glory and splendour of heaven. There is a scepter there. On his head are many crowns, thrones. He is a great king above all gods. And God can say, do not I fill heaven and earth. He is a glorious God. Who is this king of glory? 
the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, clothed with his own majesty. He hath girded himself with majesty. Who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? King of kings, the Lord sitteth king forever. Now, my dear brethren, may I say this? Such are the days in which we live, and such is the great increase in flippancy in the church and frivolity that we do not ascribe to God the honour due to his name. I sometimes cringe when I hear ministers pray. They're so shallow. It's all Jesus this and Jesus that. It's very rare you hear the Lord Jesus Christ referred to as that, is it? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The God-man. We become far too familiar with him. He is the King of Kings. He says, by me, kings reign. But then, <clears throat> I, I give these little snippets to you for comfort and consolation. For this is the, the real bottom line. Who can oppose such a king? Who can prevail against him? So here's the reality, dear brethren. Look at us this evening. If, if the ungodly were allowed to come in here and sit here see our little gathering here, they think, what a strange assortment of people. There's that fellow there with the white hair, there's a lady there uh, drinking a drink, and there's a lady, uh, they, they'd look as though we were, were sort of odd, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? Truly. And if they were to talk to us, they'd think, well, why on earth did they go into that place of worship to see those strange people? But here's the reality. Chosen not for good in me. Wakened up from wrath to flee. We are princes with him. We are blood bought. We are forgiven. Our names are indelibly written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Never, ever, ever to be erased. What an honour. We are to feel sorry for them. They feel sorry for us. Oh, you poor misguided people. Think of what you're losing. Think of what you're missing. Really? My friends, only eternity will show what they will be missing. So here we have this kingdom. No one can prevail against the king. And if we are the subjects of this kingdom, what a glorious privilege is ours. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this. This is spiritual. This is sovereign grace. Thank God for it. Well then, let us consider three things. First of all, there are that group of people who say we will not have this king to reign over us. They are obdurate. They are obstinate. They are unrepentant. They are unbelieving. And they have no desire whatsoever to be ruled over by the king who reigns here. That's the first consideration. Secondly, consider those who are the willing subjects of this kingdom. What marks them out from those who oppose themselves to the reign of this king? Who are they? What are they? How have they come into this glorious condition? What does it mean when we pray, thy kingdom come? And then lastly, and very importantly, and I believe very solemnly, the great importance of knowing that we are among the number who will enter this kingdom. Firstly then, those who have no interest in this eternal kingdom. What is the unbeliever's philosophy? Well, it's enjoy life now. Live for the here and now. Enjoy it while you have it. You're a long time dead, we hear them say. Yes, the whole of eternity. I want to enjoy it myself. I don't want to be miserable. I want to be a somebody. 
I want to be a go-getter. I want to have this. I want to have that. I want all this world has to offer me in abundance. Please do not talk to me of eternity, of sin, of God, of eternity, of holiness, of the things of the Spirit. I have no time for that. Ephesians says the natural man is dead. Totally dead. Now there is a philosophy which I don't subscribe to, a, a, a theology. You can either call it Arminianism or another version will be semi-Pelagianism. That basically says this, and some theologians teach this, which Calvin certainly didn't. But the teaching goes something like this. There is in every person a little bit of good that can somehow respond to God. So they say, you know, if you get men and women in a certain type of meeting and, and you have a certain type of preaching and with certain types of choruses and hymns and, and you get the right atmosphere, you can lull men and women into this sort of religious mentality. And if you speak to them of the love of God, you'll somehow win them over and, and they will, as it were, help God in coming together uh, to, uh, to, to, to somehow become Christian. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is totally anti-scripture. Man is dead. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Man does not want to seek God. Man cannot seek God. Every account in scripture of God is always God seeking the sinner, never the sinner running to God. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. So if we begin with this very basic doctrine of the doctrine of the natural man, he is dead in sin. He cannot please God. His understanding is darkened. He has no desire for God. He has no desire for holiness. He loves sin. One of the hardest things to get an unbeliever to do is to let, as it were, to get him from his sins. He loves his sins. Oh, I could become a Christian if I, if I didn't have to stop this. I would love to be part of what you believe, but I somehow can't let go of this. I want to hold on to this. And brethren, have we not met over the years many people who've made some sort of profession? They come into the church. They've seemed to be converted. But sooner or later, like the parable of the sower, the world drags them back. They love the world. That's the mark of the unbeliever. They love this world. Now, we who are Christians, we're in the world. We're told to be not of the world. And that marks the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian. A Christian is in the world, but he regards this world as not his home. He, he becomes more and more stranger to this world. He's passing through. He's a stranger and a pilgrim. We're marching to Zion. The world is here. He loves it here. He doesn't want anything else. His idea of heaven would be to go to heaven and to continue on in his sin for the whole of eternity. That's not the Christian, is it? The unbeliever is very consistent in his beliefs. He puts all his efforts and energies into enjoying life to the full. See the things people do. Are you ever amazed? I am. The, the, the things that people are doing today to get some joy or some enjoyment or some, if I use a horrible word, buzz, whatever that's supposed to mean. The money they spend. You know, you think of health clubs, cosmetic surgery, uh, keep fit, diets. Amazing things people do in order to, as it were, promote themselves and to enjoy more of this world. We are living in a dying world and they are dying. I want to live life to the full. I run, used to run young people's conferences for the banner. 150, 200 people. Some Christians, some not. And you saw the difference there. The Christian is fundamentally different from the unbeliever. Life in the fast lane. Work, pastimes, education, 
aim high, be somebody. Let nobody stand in your way. That's the sort of philosophy we're having today, isn't it? In schools. I had a, a fully qualified accountant come to my office. We gave him a job. The first day he was there, at 4.15, he said, I'm going home now. The next day I'm going home at 4.30. And we said, your, your hours are this. Ah, well, I, I thought I could go early. Two days. He reigned no more than three days. But you see what I'm getting at? What are our young people being taught in schools? Left-wing lunacy. Isn't it? Lunacy. The, and when I hear increasingly of, of these student bodies, various universities of great renown, what are they doing to rewrite history for the sake of lunacy? As a bell, remove the bell because it reminds us of some man who lived 200 years ago. What utter nonsense. But all in the name of being self-motivated and living life to the full. How the ungodly oftentimes put the godly to shame. They put all their energies into living for this world. Sadly, sometimes the Christians are half-hearted in living for the kingdom. Notice how the unbeliever is reluctant to dwell on the realms of eternity. Why? Because he loves this present world. He loves the pleasures of sin. I think of that amazing account in, is in Hebrews, isn't it? Where, where Moses, we read, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasures of sin for a season. That's the reality, isn't it? A man does not want to leave this world. If you've ever gone to an old people's home and seen people coming to the end of their life, unbelievers, it is horrendous. They cling to this world. Oh, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. They may be alone in the world, have not one, one to care for them. They're afraid. They've lived their whole life for themselves in total ignorance of Almighty God. And they're within a few hours or heartbeats away from eternity. Please don't let me die. Little solemn thought. And how many countless millions of men and women are in that situation ultimately, passing from this world into eternity without any hope, having loved this present world. Leave this world for what? Pie in the sky when you die? That's what they say, isn't it? This world is his home. It's all he has. He's wrapped up in it fully. Swallowed, consumed with it. It's joys, it's pastimes, it's pleasures. Man is rooted in this world. Talk to the natural man of hope. What's he say? Well, I hope... If I do get to heaven, I can enjoy the things there that I do on earth. That's his idea of heaven. Getting more fun. Having a good time. He wants the pleasures of sin for a season to go beyond the grave. His ambition is carnal to the core. Some men have some religious thoughts, like the churchman said at retirement. I have pleased God for 40 years now it's time to please myself. And that's the philosophy, isn't it? Even in the church. You see the point? The worldly man's view of heaven is really totally foreign to the, what the Bible says. It is this, to enjoy the pleasures of sin without interruption. He says, woe betide anyone who comes between me and my happiness. Talk of death, Talk of eternity, talk of heaven, talk of hell, talk of the love of God, talk of the righteousness of God, and he hates it. He has no time. God is not in all his thoughts. Look at the scriptures. The Nimrods, the Caesars, the Herods, they build their kingdoms, and God pulls them 
Do you sometimes fear, brethren, what you see happening in society? The rise of this or the rise of that? The rise of Islam. Not so long ago it was the Iron Curtain, remember? And before that the Bamboo Curtain. And over history we had the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and so on. The British Empire. Kingdoms may rise, kingdoms may fall, nations refuse to heed God's call. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Are you afraid of the future? Are you? Do you fear for young children? What they're being brought into? My dear friend, we have nothing to fear. God is on the throne. Not so for the ungodly. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. What stops many coming to Christ? Is it not a love of sin? The pleasures of sin, fun, a love of this world, the God of this world, hath blinded their eyes. And why does the devil labour so hard to deceive men and women and boys and girls about eternity? The devil believes in heaven, the devil believes in hell, very clearly. After all, the devil was cast out of heaven. And see how hard the devil tries to stop men and women coming to Christ. Oh, I could tell you the obstacles I've seen put in the paths of young people who've shown some sort of interest in, in Christian things. They seem to be so near to the kingdom. And yet, by and by, the subtlety of the devil, he has put so many things in their path, like the parable of the sower, the cares and riches, the worries and frets of this world. What will people think? How will I get a boyfriend or a girlfriend if I'm a Christian? What will my parents say? What will my friends say? Oh, we've heard them all before. I could tell you hundreds, hundreds of young people who've been in that situation. Now, at this point in time, I believe most of them are back in the world, at peace in the world. The attractions of sin, the world, the flesh and the devil. Why does the devil try so hard to delude men? To, to, to delude men? Well, he knows the certainty of heaven. He knows the certainty of everlasting bliss in the presence of Almighty God. He knows it, and he's been cast out. Heaven to the natural man is utter nonsense. It is foolishness. Foolishness. To sum up, the unbeliever, the unsaved, he simply lives for this world. Have you any time for Jesus? If you ask that person, he said, no. Little hymn says, have you any time for Jesus? They would say, no. The things of God are foolishness to him. He has no joy or interest in spiritual things. All his energies are focused on life and its present enjoyment and pleasures. If there is such a person here this evening, and I pray not, this is your condition. At this point in time, you have no title for heaven. Well then, our second consideration is this. Those that are the willing subjects of this kingdom. What it is that the believer looks for? What is it that the believer believes in? Is it not a city whose builder and maker is God? And let me put it another way. If this evening you were to be told that this world was all there was for the Christian, how would it fit with you? Would you be joyful? Another 10 million years of this, would you? I think not. Is it not the joy and anticipation of being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that spurs you on, isn't it? And in fact, can I say this? Heaven is heaven because of him. If he weren't there, it wouldn't be heaven, would it? Of course it wouldn't. A heavenly kingdom. A kingdom not of this world. Christians are described as strangers and pilgrims. And we are strange, aren't we? Look at us. I don't mean simply to look at, but in the eyes of the world, we are strange. We talk of an old book. We talk of prayer. We talk of heaven. We talk of spiritual things. And to them, they're nonsense. But to us, they're, they're all we need, aren't they? And can I say this? I'm being presumptuous, but I think it's true. We would rather be here this evening 
than anywhere else. Is that true? Why? The Spirit of God, isn't it? I don't even know some of your names. But I know your characters. It's the truth. What a glorious thing that is. And in one sense, I've just spent time with my, my loved ones, my sister, my uncle, my aunt and, and cousins. Thing. And I'm close to them. But I'm never as close to them as I am to you. I can't be, can I? We are blood bought, aren't we? We are precious. The world calls us escapists. You poor people, you can't escape. You can't cope with life, can you? You need the proper religion. That's what they say, isn't it? You can't cope with life. You're inadequates. Those who need this prop. The non-Christian lives for this world, while the Christian, thank God, lives and looks towards a kingdom not of this world. Where God dwells supreme. Where all the redeemed live. Where Jesus reigns. A kingdom to come. Look at all the great creeds and the great confessions of the Christian church. They all, without exception, look forward to a kingdom to come. Everyone. The Christian is knit to Christ. Christ is his righteousness, his joy, his portion, his hope. And do you not feel increasingly out of place here? Do you not? I do. Not simply by what I believe, but because people look at me as a Christian, certainly in business, and they think, what are you doing here? Well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but what are you doing in the world, working? Well, I'm a Christian. In the world as lights, serving the Saviour. We're not hermits. We're not ascetics. We're not escapists in that sense. No, we're in the world, but not of the world. And we realise this, that we are passing through. I may have told you of the faithful minister. I don't even know his name, but he was faithful. I know that much. That when he went to his study to prepare his sermons, he would take off his carpet slippers and put on a pair of heavy walking shoes. Think, what a strange thing to do. In your study, with a pair of walking boots on. Why did he do that? Well, he said this. To remind me, this world is not my home. I'm passing through. But how wonderful is the revelation we have of heaven? We're not told a great deal. Read the revelation. We're not told a great deal about heaven. But we're told enough to, as it were, and I say this reverently, whet our appetites. How wonderful is that vision we have? No darkness. The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. No pain. No funeral shrouds, no doctors, no sighing, no cries for repentance, no Lord's Supper, no partings, no medical requirements of any sort, no hunger, no thirst, no unfulfilled desires, bliss, endless bliss in the presence of Almighty God. But well, then what are we told of this kingdom to come? It's free from all evil. There will be no bodily wants. Food, clothes, sleep, hunger, no armour to protect us from the evil one. No sh sword, no shield, no helmet, nothing. The weapons laid down. The warfare finished. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of thy master. Whilst here on earth the believer, along with the unbeliever, has many needs. We are very needy, aren't we? We're very dependent. And the older you get, do you not find you're more dependent? When I was a young man, I didn't know what it was to take a pill or a tablet. Not so now. You get the regular notes from the hospital, the, the, the doctor. You need this test, you need that test. You've got to come for this appointment, that appointment. Not in heaven. Gone. No needs. In this heavenly realm, we shall have no imperfections. Now, you can't believe I had fiery red hair, can you? 
Well, you see, no one believes that. But it's true, fiery red hair. Mr. KFC. Eh? Not in heaven. No bodily needs. No imperfections. No dentures. Interesting, isn't it? Our ignorance is more than our knowledge of heaven. Man's fallen, marred nature will be made new, new creatures. And things we, we can't comprehend this side of eternity will be made altogether plain and certain the other side of eternity, won't they? No toil. No labour. No sweat. No needing any qualification. No studying. I went to the chemist yesterday and there was two young people there working in the chemist. And whilst they were not serving, they were having their textbooks out, studying for their A-levels. And one said, I'm studying mathematics. And one said, I'm studying biology. And their faces dropped. See? None of that in heaven. Gone. Ecclesiastes says, all things are full of labour, but not in heaven. We cannot labour to get to heaven, and there will be no labour in heaven. Revelation says, they rest from their labours. In this kingdom to come, we shall be free from all corruption. All corruption. Imagine what that means. It means this. When you come to the evening to have your evening devotions, you won't have to beg for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me. None of that in heaven. Lord, give me more grace. None of that in heaven. Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, for grace to love. None of that in heaven. Faith gives way to sight, isn't it? Why on earth are we so often miserable and downcast? Well, I can tell you. Because of our own corruptions. Our sin. Our desire to sin. Our cleaving after things that do us no good. But in heaven, no sin. No desire to sin. No sorrow. No need of repentance. No more apologising. No losses. No strivings against sin. Everything so different. No more cares. No worries about the future. How worry tortures our minds oftentimes. Fretting. Sadness. Consumed with care. Freed from sin and freed from care. That's the blessed position of every child of God. There will be no doubts. Am I a Christian? Uh, and the devil won't be able to say, you hypocrite, you've gone too far. How dare you call yourself a Christian? And how many times do we have to say, I am a sinner of the deepest, I, but the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from all my sin. None of that in heaven. No gossip. No slander. No backbiting, no tongue to control, no pride, no presumption or secret motives. We are very good sometimes at hiding our motives, aren't we? How pleasant we sometimes are when we can be quite scathing with our little comments. We don't mean it, of course, but we do. But we try and hide it. The wicked will not be there. There will be no divisions. There will be no Presbyterians or Baptists in heaven. No Calvinists or Arminians. No gospel standards. No strict and particulars. No Pentecostals. No Moravians. For all will be one. Glorious, isn't it? No quarrels over versions of the Bible. He's ESV. I'm an AV. I'm AV, really. None of that in heaven. Dare I go on. Again, something we do not always consider. In this kingdom to come, thank God, we shall be spared all the torments of hell. Jesus hath delivered us from the wrath to come. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? 
Heaven is eternal bliss in the presence of God. Unending bliss. In his presence are pleasures forevermore. Streets paved with gold. No need of light. Compare this coming kingdom with the place of eternal separation. Pain is never mitigated there. Self-accusation is continual, weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth. There will be no balm of Gilead in that place of separation. No intermission, no respite, no rest day or night. In this kingdom to come, the redeemed see nothing of the torments of hell. And praise God, there is this unbridgeable gulf. Thank God. And the highest delight in this kingdom will be to see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's Lamb. He is all the glory. He, we shall behold his glory. Praise God, we shall be like him. We have tasted grace here and we shall enjoy the fullness of grace in eternity. My last consideration as I close is this. The great importance, the great necessity of knowing if we belong to this blessed kingdom. Look again, what does our text say? Thy kingdom come. We're enjoined to pray that. Do we really desire this? Remember, this is the prayer the pattern our Lord taught his people. Christians are to pray, thy kingdom come. What does it mean? When you pray, thy kingdom come, what does it mean? Firstly, it is a prayer, a plea, I believe, for the kingdom of grace to be established in the hearts of individuals. Thy kingdom come where? Here. That grace may increase. You know, I think it was Robert Murray McShane who said this, Lord, every day he prayed this, Lord, Make me a holy man. Make me a holy man. Surely, brethren, our daily prayer must be something like this. Lord, more grace. More grace. And when I have more grace, I want more grace. We can never have too much grace, can we? Secondly, it's a prayer that God may hasten the coming of his kingdom. There was a society many years ago called the Prophetic Testimony League. It was organised by a man called Dr. Frederick Tatford. And they were people who lived in daily anticipation of the second coming of the Lord Jesus. A bit like the Thessalonians. You know, they were, they had packed up work, they stopped working, and Paul said to them, you know, why are you doing that? He said, well, we're waiting for him to come. Well, it was very commendable in some ways, but they got it wrong. They stopped working. We are to continue. But this dear man, Frederick Tatford, uh, and his followers, they were very sincere. Uh, they, they lived in this anticipation that he would come. And they spoke incessantly of the rapture. When he comes, the trump will sound. And they used to speak with And their faces would change. And you'd, I remember seeing this dear man who would be preaching, and suddenly he'd stop, and then he'd sort of go off at a tangent about the rapture. Well... I'm not saying they were right or wrong, but I think they were perhaps a bit too, as it were, unbalanced in that sense. But we don't think about the second coming enough, do we? We live as though it's a long way away. He may come. When no man knoweth. In the twinkling of an eye. And our prayer surely is that, Lord, hasten that day. Nevertheless, Come, Lord Jesus, come. These two desires are totally compatible. Grace begins here in the heart, the new birth, regeneration, conversion, but it also proceeds till actually we are in heaven, when we enter those glorious gates of heaven. Or if you wish, the kingdom has come. The, grace of, the kingdom of grace is glory in the daybreak, and the kingdom of glory is grace in the fall. Grace and glory are inseparable in scripture. You cannot have one without the other. Grace in the heart now assures us of glory in the kingdom to come. Well then, as I just close, let me just recap. 
We have seen something of those who have no part nor lot in this kingdom. Make no mistake, Hebrews 2 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? These are not only re- neglected, but they've rejected. They reject God. They reject his word. They reject his son. They reject God's offers of mercy and peace and pardon. They are in darkness. They are dead. They're in a state of enmity with a holy God. How can they prevail? We have also seen something of the king who reigns there. Of that endless bliss that awaits those who enter that kingdom. May I ask, how do you pray? Do we pray this, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. That we have more grace in our heart now to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, to be more like him. But may I also ask, do we pray that God may hasten the coming of his kingdom? My dear friends, For many of us, the time is almost well spent. A few more days, weeks, months, perhaps years, who knows? In the midst of life, we are in death. Not to be gloomy, but to be realists. And surely, the message we must bring to dying men and dying women, as the words of Richard Max, he says, I preach as though never to preach again. A dying man to dying men. Oh, be in time. Be in time. Whilst the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. If in sin you longer wait, you may find no open gate. And your cry be just too late. Be in time. Let us sing our